Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 through 21. We are beginning our new series in Daniel. I also want to apologize. I am recording this outside. Uh, so if you hear birds or cars or wind, um, that's, that's what's going on here. I apologize. But here we go. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord de delivered into Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to his God in Babylonia and put them, uh, put in the treasure house of his God. This is how our story starts. It's the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. Uh, this would put us in around 50, um, or sorry, not 50, 605 AD. Or, wow, I'm so off. Sorry, B.C. Nebuchadnezzar has just come back from the conquest of Egypt. And on the way back from defeating the Egyptians, he sweeps by Jerusalem and he besieges the city. Jehoiakim falls into the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar. The prophets had foretold this. Jeremiah was saying that this was going to happen. Along with some of the articles from the Temple of God. If you go to the end of um, Hezekiah's life. There is a prophecy there uh, that one day the Babylonians will come and they will take the articles of gold from the house of God. And now we see that happening in Daniel chapter 1. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put the treasure, uh, put in the treasure house of his God. So basically the king of Babylon is saying he's greater than the kings that, or the gods of, of Israel. God of Israel. So that's, that's how our story begins. We'll go down to the bottom here and we'll start our our little plot. So verses one through two. Um, I'm just going to put Neb uh, sieges Jerusalem and takes temple articles. All right, let's continue. Verse three. Then the king ordered Ash. Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them the daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They would be trained for three years and after that enter the king's service. So, Let's go back down to, well, before we go down to the bottom. So he has a court official bring in Israelites. And we might be asking, you know, why? And the answer is that uh, Jehoiakim has just become a vassal king to Nebuchadnezzar, which means he has to pay tribute to Nebuchadnezzar every year. Well, if Israel is going to be a vassal state to Babylon, it would be good for Babylon then to have some advisors in the king's service who are from the Israelites. And so he doesn't take just anybody from the Israelites. He takes the people from the royal family, the nobility, the ones who are going to know how to work with um, the, the leadership of Israel, and he brings them in. And what he wants is these young men without defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning. They want to, he wants them to be good at acquiring and bringing in knowledge, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. And what they want to do with these guys is basically indoctrinate them into the way of the Babylonians. This was a um, three-year school crash course in Babylon. And remember that this is a time where, you know, science and astrology and culture is all boiled into this one thing. And so it's as much religion and Babylonian gods and Babylonian language as anything. It's, it's, it's all of these things. And then after that, they're to enter the king's service. So this is an indoctrination course. So we're going to go three through five here at the bottom. And quite a bit happens, right? Verses 3 through 5. The big piece is Daniel and friends are taken, right? But in this is Neb orders uh, to make Israelite advisors. And then the second thing in this is exile begins. Daniel and his friends are in this situation because their leadership has been evil and they're suffering the consequences of that because they're being um, exiled. 
Now this takes place in 605 BC, which is about almost uh, 20 years before the fall. The fall of Jerusalem happens in 586 BC. That's when the 70 years of exile begin for the whole nation. So for the next 20 years, right, 19 years here, Daniel and his friends are going to live in exile. They're going to live in Babylon hearing about Jerusalem get sieged, watching more exiles come in the future, and all the while be serving King Nebuchadnezzar. It's a very difficult situation to be in. Among those were chosen some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, the chief official gave them new names. Daniel became Belteshazzar, Hananiah to Shadrach, Mishael to Meshach, and Azariah to Abednego. So we'll go back down to the bottom here. Verse 6. Um, all the boys are renamed. Now, um, every one of their names deals and relates to God. And every one of their new names relates to the gods of the Babylonians. So there's a lot being said in that renaming, but also renaming is a very normal part of coming into a new culture. Um, so it's not that crazy that this is happening, that the renaming is happening, but it is really interesting that all of the names are, are bent towards the Babylonian deities. And it does show they're, they're trying to push down, if you will, their Jewish identity and, and bring them into a stronger um, Babylonian one. And that's why the very first word of chapter of uh of eight is so important but daniel resolved not to defile himself with the names no not with the names but with the royal food and wine so that's going back up to this the king assigned a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table and daniel is resolved not to fight back not to be rebellious not to be evil but to just not eat the royal food and wine we might ask the question why and the answer is probably that the food at the king's table had been involved in some sort of um, idolatrous ceremony, some sacrifice to the Babylonian gods, maybe a sacrifice to the king himself. Or, secondly, maybe the king's table has pig in it or the meat still has blood in it. It's just been prepared in ways that Israelites would not eat. And so this word, I'm not going to defile myself, it means I'm not going to sin against God by eating the royal food and wine. And... He asked the chief official, so it sounds like this same guy up here, Ashpenaz, for permission not to defile himself this way. So let's just go back to the, down to the bottom. We'll just start right, start right there. Uh, verse 7. Daniel resolves to follow God. No king's food. Now, if you're this guy over here, uh, Ashpenaz, that's it's kind of a scary request. Oh, that was verse 7, sorry. All right, I'll fix that when we go down. Now, God had caused the official to show a favor and compassion to Daniel. We might be asking, where is God in this story? And, and he shows up in his sovereignty, causing this official, who's handpicked Daniel and the other boys, um, to have compassion towards Daniel. So he has compassion, he's understanding, but he's in a difficult situation. I'm afraid of my Lord the King. I'm afraid of Nebuchadnezzar, who's assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The King would then have my head because of you, right? Like it's clear that he has compassion, favor towards Daniel. He doesn't want to make the King mad. So in verse six through seven, that's what happens. In verse eight, Daniel resolves not to fo not to uh, to follow God. No king's food, and let's also add asks nicely, right? And then in verses nine through ten, um, official has heart turned by God, but once. Daniel to eat well. So what do we do? How does Daniel respond to this situation? Does he say, I'm not going to sin against my God or whatever? No, it, it's incredible how much tact Daniel has. Daniel then said to the guard, whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, to the guard here, not to the chief official. 
Please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Doesn't sound like a super nourishing and strengthening diet. Not what I would recommend for growing boys. Uh, by the way, vegetables here means uh, from the seed. So it could also include things like fruit and bread, which we're not going to debate diets here, but I, I, I would still think that meat would be more nutritious, uh, especially for a growing boys. Then compare our appearance with that of young men who would eat the royal food. Treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this, agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. So uh, 11 through 13. Daniel tactfully proposes a test. And then verse 14, guard agrees. All right. This is just, it's sneaky, it's wise, it's, it's the way to do things uh, when you're in exile. Maybe it wouldn't be the way things would do uh, do things otherwise, but but as an exile, uh, this is how you you operate. You operate wisely. That's why Jesus tells us to be um, as crafty as a serpent, but yet innocent as a dove. And that is exactly what what Daniel is doing. Oh, and then verse fourteen, guard agrees. Okay, good. Fifteen. At the end of ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So they are they are winning. And maybe it's because of the diet. Maybe it's because God's helping. Doesn't really matter. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables and said, and this commitment is not because they love vegetables. It's because they don't want to defile themselves and God blesses them because of it. He blesses this desire not to defile themselves. So verses 15 through 16, the boys win. Woohoo! And then um, I think you see God's blessing. And you could, you could argue that verse 15, 16 belongs up here. Um, you could also argue that, that this is 17. Um, I'm just going to throw verse 17 up there. If you disagree, that's fine. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding and all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dream all kinds of dreams. The, 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 the pinnacle here is God's blessing of these four. What's important to remember here is their their ability to gain knowledge and understanding and all kinds of literature and learning means they are really good at understanding Babylonian doctrine, Babylonian ways, Babylonian beliefs. Daniel can go beyond this and understand visions and dreams of different kinds. Uh, God is gifting them with, with wisdom and they're going to use it in Babylon for the sake of Babylon according to Babylonian principles. All these sorts of things we would think, you know, why would God uh, bless them in this? But this is the life of an exile, and he blesses them because of their, they're already committed to not defiling themselves. They're not going to become Babylonians in this. What's really interesting is that um, among those who were chosen were some from Judah. So these four get singled out, likely because the other ones basically became Babylonians. These four really devoted themselves to the Lord and God gave them uh, great gifts, and then as a result of that, they succeed, and they become head and shoulders above everybody else. At the end of the time, set by the king to bring them service, that's the three years, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, or Azariah. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. And so here this kind of like falling portion, but, but quite great, is verses 19, ooh, right, 19, 18 through 20. Um, Daniel and, the, and his friends are wiser than the wise men. And that's where you want to be. As a believer, 
in exile, you want to be wiser than the wise men. You want to know the world systems better than the world knows their own systems. And still, at the end of the day, be committed to Yahweh. And it is from that position that Daniel and his friends are going to be able to um, influence well the things that are happening in Babylon and to um, help out Israel. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Now, King Cyrus is the first king of not the Babylonians. The Babylonians will be replaced by a new empire called the Medo-Persian Empire. And Cyrus is the first king of the Medo-Persian Empire. He will uh, come back to the city in about 539, somewhere in there, um, BC, and take the city of Babylon. And what's saying is that Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus, all the way at least until 539. It's highly likely that King Cyrus is also the man named Darius that we see elsewhere in uh, the book of Daniel, uh, the one that throws him into the lion's den. And if that's the case, then uh, Cyrus, also Darius, his rule ends in 530 BC. And what we would understand here by this word remained doesn't mean that Daniel's last year of employment was 539, but he continued even into the reign of King Cyrus. So that's this story. And what we're beginning to see is how should exiles live um, in exile? How should Christians live in exile? And it starts with Daniel and his friends.